cool. Okay, we're going to have fun tonight. Don't yell at me. Okay, and uh, why don't you just take your seats, that'd be great. Who knows how to play chess? How many chess players? Now, what I gather about chess, the goal of the game is to checkmate. Okay? Threaten the inescapable, capture the opponent's king. Which one is the king? Is that it? The cross. So the... The aim of the game is to take out all of the supports. Take this sucker out. As I was thinking about chess, I'm not a master at chess. I'm not that really good at it at all. But I've got a funny feeling that in the heavenlies, there's a chess game going on. And I'll explain as we go through this tonight. I believe that Jesus and Satan play chess. You may say, John, theologically not sound. <laughs> but neither was any of Corey's sermons today. So just, just keep that within your mind because when I was born, the chessboard began to move. And when you were born, the chessboard over your life started to move because God had a plan and purpose for you. And the enemy's plan and purpose was to take you out, but God's plan and purpose was to make you the king and a winner in your life. So when John was born, the heavens began to sing. But five years of age, the enemy started to play chess and was trying to take me out. I was given poison enough to kill two adults. My, we were brought up on the farm and my siblings gave me sheep dip. And I almost died. And the enemy said, checkmate. But God was ahead of the move. Because my mother got hold of me in a nice, lovely way. Got me by the leg, swung me around the head in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. And I vomited every bit of poison out of my body. Thank God for a strong mum. So Jesus is ahead of it. At seven years of age, playing in the backyard, and a king brown snake almost got me. And the devil says, this will take him out. But he didn't realize that John had a mother that didn't give a rip about brown snakes. It's interesting that all through history we see these moves, checks, moves, check, checkmate, move. And it seems like the enemy's always trying to take out the person that is called by God and that has a destiny of God. We see in the Garden of Eden, Eden that God creates man and woman. It was a God move. And then the enemy comes as the serpent from the field, and he tempts. 
And he kind of makes a move. And Adam and Eve succumb to the move. And the enemy says, checkmate. But God had a plan. There was a consequence, but there was a plan. Put some fig leaves on. Come on. Come on, you've, you've started something now that's going to affect the generations, positive and neg negatively. But it's amazing. God's always head of the plan. You go to Genesis 6. Satan's move again. Immorality. Bad things happening on the earth. Satan's move, counter move, trying to take the testimony and the people of God out of the earth. But God made a move. And he put his hand on a guy called Noah. And Noah built the ark. And Noah was faithful for a hundred years, preaching, teaching. No one responded to his message apart from his three sons and their three wives. And the enemy says, ah, still check, 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 check. All the animals came. Noah went into the, the ark. His family and God closed the door. And God said to the enemy, checkmate, you didn't win again. In Exodus, Satan moves again. Children of Israel find themselves in slavery. And it just seems like slavery was just coming more and more upon them. They were there in a good season, but things changed. And, and now as Israel was growing bigger, and obviously they were a threat to the enemy. Satan moves again with a move, counter move. Let's make slaves of these people. Let's make this slavery impossible. But God moves and raises up a person called... Thank you. And makes a move. But the more he kind of speaks, the enemy comes with a counter move. He says, no, I'm not going to let them go. And then God had another move, the 12 plagues of, that, that came upon Egypt. And we just see, as we look at history, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. Satan's move. Pharaoh won't let the people go. God's move. Ten plagues. Check. They get out of Egypt. And they're going towards the promised land. And Pharaoh has a change of mind. And he starts to send his soldiers after them. So Israel is at a place called the Red Sea. And Satan is saying, oh, we've got a good move here. We've got a good move here. We're going to have them stuck. We're going to have the Egyptians behind them, the Red Sea in front of them. They are going to be wiped out. Satan steps up and he says, checkmate. But Moses heard from God. And all night he stood with his rod across the Red Sea. And the water parted. You see, as we look at Bible history, the devil tries to checkmate. But in God, there's no checkmate. There's no move that kind of stumps God or stumps the people of God if we're aware of this. So all through the Bible, there's move, there's counter move. And then you get to a, a part in Bible history where we come to this book called Malachi. Or if you're from Queensland, Malachi. <clears throat> and for 400 years, from Malachi through to Matthew, it seems like Jesus and Satan are kind of thinking, what is the next move? 400 years, stalemate. Can't make a move. Eyeing each other off. Then Jesus is born. The enemy hears about it. Let's make another move. Let's kill all the children in Israel or in Egypt. Israel. And we just see God moves. Satan moves. God moves. Satan moves. Satan moves. Let's, let's crucify Jesus. Then 
then we'll have him move. God moves. Jesus Christ is crucified. The enemy says, Jesus is dead. Checkmate. God says to Satan, Jesus is dead. Checkmate. The enemy thinks he knows everything. And when you feel your deadest, that's the moment when God yells out to the enemy, checkmate, he will live again. Because if the principalities and powers had known what crucifying the Lord of glory would accomplish, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. So all through we see check, 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 move, move. Happens in your life. Happens in our world. Here's the question. The dream inside of you, does it match the reality you see? The dream inside of you, does it match the reality? Before the creation of the world, God knew you. And he called you and set you apart. That you can live as a king. Live as a queen. And as you journey on life, God moves, enemy moves, God moves, enemy moves. What's he trying to do? He's trying to frustrate the plan and purpose of God for your life. The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus Christ comes, what? To give us life and life more abundantly. So here's my question tonight. The dream inside why doesn't it match the reality I see? So what do you do when you feel that the enemy has checkmate or, or, or made a move and you just kind of think, I, I feel like I'm stuck in your workplace. God's put you there. Then the enemy moves. He says, check. Are we going to leave it like that or are we going to turn to God? And are we going to say, God, you've got a plan and you've got a purpose for my life, for my work situation? We get married, we have kids, they're doing great, they get the teenage, and then the enemy starts to make moves. Sometimes he says, check. Sometimes he says, checkmate. But you've got to look at what is God's move? What is God's move? Or in your marriage. And I was talking to people, they've been married for a little while, someone over here for five months. Others for 21 years, and others getting married and all that kind of stuff. And, and we get married and it's absolutely fantastic, you know. And then, oh, what happened? And it seems like the enemy begins to move. Nothing has changed. Your eyes just got opened. And it seems like the enemy kind of moves a bit and you, and you just kind of think, man, what's God's move? What's, what's the move that I should do here? But if you understand that God, as we look at history, that God always has a counter move for every move of the enemy. In your ministry, you may be serving somewhere and it's, it, it was good, but now, oh man, it's, it's, it's not flowing anymore. What's happened? Well, it could be a move of the enemy. But the greatest thing is, what's your move going to be? Are you going to allow that move to take you out? Are you going to let it be a checkmate? Or are you going to look to God and say, God, what is the move? What is the change? What do I need to tweak within my life to move forward? Financially, doing good. You got a job. So cool. You get a mortgage. You buy a car. You get a McDonald's. Everything's fine, you're tithing, and all of a sudden, check. Checkmate. Checkmate. You know the amazing thing? The first thing we used to do is if we get a, a check within our, within our giving, we stop tithing. That's the worst thing you can do because he's the one that's going to help you out. You've got to give your way out. And then we've got to go to God and say, God, what is our next move? There is never a checkmate. And I could tell you about financial situations that I've gone through personally 
And I'm a, I'm a pretty good steward, but sometimes things happen left field. You've got to look at what God's move. He wants to take you out. The enemy wants to take you out. He wants to put side moves on you. And, but God's ahead of it. I've got a word for you tonight. Some people quit, but they keep turning up. They quit emotionally. Some people have quit on their marriage. You're still together, but you've quit. Some to get people have quit on their kids. They're still there, but you're out of there. And on church and on God. But I really believe tonight the Spirit of God wants to rise something strong in your heart. That you won't, that you won't quit. Because you understand tonight that there's two forces within your life. You got God that's abundantly working, and you got the enemy who's trying to make moves and trying to make checkmates within your life to frustrate the plan and purpose of God upon your life. Don't quit in the hole. And you may be young, you may be old, but don't quit in the hole. Romans 8:28 reads like this. You know it well. And we know. That all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to the purpose of God. Do you know the scripture well? I like what the Living Bible and a few other translations mix together. Everything works out for good for those who love God and to those who are fitting into the plan of God for their life. Everything works out for good to those who love God and to those who are fitting into the plan of God for their life. I love that. So does everything work out for your good? No. Everything works out for his good. And if it's his good, it's my good. Not everything goes my way. That's what annoys me sometimes. But as I just give it time and as I stand back, you know, from the chessboard as it were, I can understand, thank God that did not work out the way that I wanted it to work out. Thank God I didn't marry that person. Thank God I didn't go to that place. Thank God I didn't follow through on that relationship. Thank God I didn't follow through on that, on that purchase. Because everything... If we give God space, we'll work out for His good. And if it's His good, it's for my good and for the kingdom of God. Yeah. How you going? Good? Who likes stories? I like stories. Tell me a story before I go to bed. Don't worry about it. I've got good news. We win. <laughs> when I was 19, I left home. I'm a pastor's kid. The only way you left home was if you died or you went to Bible school. I didn't die. I didn't go to Bible school, but I left home. I was 19 of years of age, wasn't doing well in my life, but something got dropped in my heart to go to Perth. And I was a very insecure kind of person and go to Perth. Talk to my parents about it. Yeah, go to Perth. God moves. I go over there, didn't know a soul, didn't know anybody because I was living in Albury and wanted to go the furthest part away to get away from God, to get away from my parents, to get away from people that were trying to encourage me to follow God. So I, I go over there, didn't know a soul, stayed in a hotel the first night, the next day went around looking for a boarding school, you know, a place to stay, knocked on the door. Someone who opened the door was a Christian from my hometown. God moves. So I stayed there, got into church. Everybody in that church went to, you know, that was called, went to a Bible college in New Zealand. So I go to the pastor and say, hey, I, I want to go to Bible college. He said, no, mate, you're not ready. You're a lunatic. You, 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 you just adjust your jet set, man. 
So it's interesting to look. So I waited another year and I went to the, the, the pastor again. And I said, I, I really want to go to Bible college. He said, yeah, right, it's the right time. Off you go. Isn't it amazing where you can see God moving things? So I go to New Zealand. The first person I met when I go to Bible college was a young lady called Carol Cave. What a name. She is now my wife. God moves. The other person I met over there as I went to Carol's church was a guy called Brian Houston. So we created a friendship. God moves. It seems like sometimes everything falls into place. And then I had it in my heart to go back and work with my dad. And, and he promised me the world that when I go back there, I'll pastor his church. You'll give me a salary and all those kind of things. God bless dad. So I go back to my dad's church, take my wife with me. And he picks me up at the airport and he says, John, a couple of things. He says, number one, there's, there's no money. We can't pay you. And number two, you're not going to be the assistant pastor. You're going to be the youth pastor. The only bad news about being the youth pastor is no youth. Is, is God moving? Who's that kind of stuff? So I, I, I work for my dad for a while. And he says, oh, you're doing pretty good. I, he, he says, I'm going to take three months off. You look after the church. It was only a small church, 25 people. So I, I look after the church and then he goes on holidays. And in three months, it grew from 25 people to 60. God, God, was, God was helping me. And then it seemed like there was some action on the chessboard because my loving father came back and he sacked me. He reckons I was good and too good. What's going on here? Thanks, Dad. Dad's dead so I can talk about him. No, I love my dad. That was the best thing he ever did for me. So what do you do? We're kind of who's at work in here? Where, where's the move and all those kind of stuff? And I just went home and told my wife and said, "Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm <clears throat> so I just surrendered to God and said, "Okay, I'll just be a, I'll just be a good boy, go to church, pay my tithe." Three days later, I got a call from a person that I met ages ago by the name of Brian Houston. And he says, my dad has been given an old church in Liverpool. It's, it's only a building. It's all closed down. It's, it's run down. Three people left in it. Do you want it? Oh, hallelujah. No, I don't. He asked me three times, do you want it? I don't want to go. Who wants to go to flipping Liverpool, the armpit of the world? You know. You know. Yeah. So three times he asked me. And, and in the end, he said, do, how do you feel about it? I said, well... You know, Billy Graham hasn't given me a prophecy yet. Yeah. He said, how do you feel about it? I said, oh, I'm wounded. I need healing to the memories. He said, no, how do you feel about it? I said, man, I feel okay about it, but I haven't got a word. Because you remember the days you had to have a word? You know, a word? You know, and we still need a word, but back in those days where it had to be a word, you know. And I, I said, I, I haven't got a word. I feel peace about it. He said, well, come back and look. So I went and had a look and it, it was okay. I had nothing else to do. 27-year-old, married, one kid. Let's do it. But I should have investigated more because 16 years prior to me coming, they went through 11 pastors. It was not only the armpit of the world, it was a preacher's graveyard. And you look at the chessboard and you just kind of think, enemy, are you trying to set me up? And each of the last pastors that left, they left sick or their wives were left sick. And you just think, what's, what's going on in my world? We were there for six months. Bang, it happened. My wife got sick. There is sinister atmospheres. I'm not a spook. We are greater than that. But there are sinister atmospheres. Because they're working the chessboard of life. 
They see what's kind of heading for you and, and the enemy will put things in the way. Even though you may get a good run for a while, sir, and I'm not prophesying it, I'm just making you aware we're not ignorant of the schemes of the enemy. And she was put in hospital for mystery sickness and, and she's in there for weeks and, and, and a pastor came down just to help, you know, preach on a Sunday because I was a bit overwhelmed with kids and church. And so after church, we went down there and we were speaking and then all of a sudden he disappeared. Then I called up to him later and I said, oh, where did you go? He said, oh, John, I was, I was sitting there. And he said, I just really believe it's a satanic attack. And he prayed. The next day she was out of hospital. You see, the enemy tries to get checkmate. But you've got to remember what God has said. And you might say, I don't know everything that God said. But he said, number one, you're a child of God. That'll do any time. A couple more years to pastoring the church, we, we grew rapidly from naught to 200 in a year. Never had any musicians. It was tough. You might say, John, how come you're so tough today? It's my upbringing. You know, and I, I'm not tough. But I've, I've learned a few secrets that I won't give up. And we used to preach Sunday mornings and, you know, you cry out of very receptive and, oh, you're pretending to be anyway, and, and but really receptive. But it, it seemed like the words just kept falling down here, like hitting a brick wall. And it was just tough. And you just what am I going to do? And even though we had a crowd, there was no cohesion. People were very divisive because uh, it was just very difficult. No money. I had to buy and sell cars to, to make money and pay our rent and our, our wage. Anything we could spend on our food each week was $20. And I remember my wife coming home one day. She says, I was so embarrassed. I spent $22 at the checkout. And I had to put groceries back and everyone was looking at me. And this is 35 years ago. You could, you know, it's probably 100 bucks today. I don't know. And that Saturday afternoon, I remember, was not very good. She said, I've had enough of this. This is two years into it. I've had enough. There's no money. You're never home. The kids are driving me crazy. What are you going to do about it? Checkmate. So I did what every man would do. I went out to the back shed. And I got the mower out. And I start to mow the lawn. <laughs> Stupid woman. <laughs> Plants and all. <laughs> then I start to cry. I'm not, a, I'm not a crier. Presence of God, come on me. I could take you to the place. Four Caulfield Crescent, St. John's Park. I could take you to the place. Presence of God hit me. Bam. Time for God to move. And he said, from this day on, I will start to exalt you in the sight of the nation. It didn't mean a thing to me because I'm nothing and no one. But what it did, it put a light in my darkness. It gave me hope. And God will always speak light in your darkest moment. And checkmate was over. Things began to change from that moment on, not dramatically, but you could see there was a shift. Why? Because God and Jesus play chess. And God is working on the situation for you to win. The enemy is working on the situation that all the men can fall down. But I want to tell you, it's not God's plan and purpose that he triumphs. It's God's plan and purpose that God's plan and purpose, triumph in your life. Oh, I love this. One more story. I love stories. Liverpool's 
back in those days. They used to call it the Povo area. People said, John, don't go there. You'll never build a church. You'll never see your dreams fulfilled. I, I didn't know what that meant. So we start to save our money and wasn't much to save. So we thought we'd buy. And that's just how it happened. I was walking around my little church one day. I felt the Holy Spirit saying, is this what you want? I said, no. And from that moment, I began to look for land. And we looked for ages for land. And then in the end, we found this land, five acres, $240,000. Sorry, $200,000. We didn't even money to buy it. 200,000 bucks for five acres. So we left for a couple of years and saved up a little bit more money. And then, yeah, we, we could afford to buy it now. So before we bought it, went to the council and we spoke to them and just said, if we buy this land, it's flood prone. If we, if we buy it and if we build it up, we will be allowed to, you know, build our building there. And the mayor said, yes. The town planner said, yes. I said, good. I know you guys will forget me. Can I have it in writing? Yes, got it in writing. Put our money together, brought the block of land. Went up $20,000, so we paid $240,000 for it. Put our development application in. It came back, no, you cannot build on that land, and you never will. You see, there is always forces you move the enemy moves. But you've got to know that what you're doing is in the mind of God. So I went back to the council and I said, what are you going? What's going on about? You said we could buy this place. No, you can't. I came and spoke to you. No, you didn't. Here's the letter. Oh, yes, you did. But everything's changed. And for two years, backs and forwards, playing chess, backs and forwards, backs and forwards in the council. Then one night, the Lord gave me his word. He's going to give me an advocate. Oh, God's at work again. That week, the deputy mayor's son shifted into our church. I spoke to him. He spoke to his father. Long story short, I got the opportunity to speak to the council. That night when I was standing there in fear and trepidation, I just said, you know, we brought this land in good faith and it was all okay for us to build. And, and now it's not happening. Miraculously, thank God. The whole council come onto my side. The, the, one of the councillors got up, pointed to the mayor and the town plan. He said, you persecuted this religious body for long enough. There's no justified reason why you can't let them build. Kabam, that night. The enemy will go checkmate on your calling. He will go checkmate on your destiny. But I want to tell you, if God's in it, he will make a way. And all the time, while we're struggling with this, the Catholic club, which was more prone to flooding than us, was going ahead. So there was a precedent set, and Jesus Christ won out. A little bit more of the story? That's pretty exciting, that bit. So, so we, we got permission to build. So we're only 150 people. This is back in 1988. So we got the plans drawn up for our new building. $1.1 million. I didn't think I needed money. Where's the money going to come from? Ah. You know, my stupidity and the enemy manipulating things and that kind of stuff. And so I began to fast and pray. You want to know why I'm skinny? I used to fast a lot. Now I stress a lot. And so, so there it was for nine days. I just fasted and prayed. And I got a phone call. Hey, John, there's a fundraiser from America that's in Australia at the moment. And he wants to raise money for, for church buildings out of your congregation. I said, I'm in. So he came in. You listen to this. You want to talk about miracles where God can give you a good run on the board. Out of 30 couples, we raised $750,000. kingdom of God goes forever a little bit more. Count on myself. I used to come home from church. I'd send her to work to do cleaning at night. And so we put our contribution in. And the rest of the money was raised from the congregation. You see, the enemy wants to frustrate and make moves. But God got more moves. Are you hearing me today? 
And I just get amazed at the grace of God that has, we've just seen Him come through time and time again in our personal lives, in our church life, and just seeing Him triumph time and time again. He will say, checkmate, but God says there is a way through in Jesus' name. I want to encourage you tonight, if you are stuck in the hole, allow the Holy Spirit to stir your heart in Jesus' name. Let me just read this scripture to you more. Think about closing. What shall we say to these things? Uh, hello. What shall we say to these things? Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not freely also freely give us all things. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, as is written, we are killed all day long. Good to die to yourself. We are counted as sheep to the slaughter. Yet... In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Even though the enemy may play chess. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want to tell you tonight. You're not stuck with the hand you have. You need to tweak that. You're not stuck with the hand you have. I could be stuck somewhere small, somewhere insignificant. Our church could be stuck. But if you can understand that God always has the next move, you won't be stuck. Amen? And to be honest with you, it makes sense to quit when you're in hell. Hello? It makes sense to quit when you're in the hole. But I want to tell you, your destiny is on the other side of that hole. Your destiny is on the other side of what the enemy may call checkmate. Your destiny is on the other side of it. He may say they're not educated enough. They may say you're not smart enough. But I want to tell you, God has all the pieces that He needs to see you get to where you need to go. Look at David. King David. Man, move. Counter move. Move. Counter move. Slew Goliath, counter move. Got promoted, got demoted, kept the right spirit. God kept on moving upon his life. The enemy tried to take him out, but God was always ahead of the situation. Joseph, a dream from God, God moved. Brothers hated him, the enemy moves. Sold him to traders. <laughs> Checkmate. But God was with him before and after. He was with him when he was with his brothers. And when he assaulted the Pharaoh, God was still with him. There's no such thing as a checkmate in God. So many of here, Daniel forsaken, but God was with him. Got a promotion, thrown the lines in. The enemy kind of checkmate, but God was with him. God was with him. Come on, church, God is with us. Now just write this down, it's so important. The devil is not afraid of who you are. He's afraid of what you'll become. He's not afraid of this church. He's afraid of what it's going to become. He's not afraid of you as an individual. He's afraid of what you'll become. He's not afraid of your marriage. He's afraid of what your marriage will produce. He's not afraid of your children. And he's afraid of what they'll become. And that's why he's always manipulating trying to take you out. I believe you don't have to be stuck. Just take a step and let's see God come through in Jesus' name.
Listen to this. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is wholly his. What does that mean? It means this. Job, some of the heavenly beings were together and God says to Satan, Satan, where have you been? He says, I've been roaming around the world. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro. The enemy wanders around. What does that mean to me? God is always ahead of him. Are you hearing me? God is ahead. It doesn't matter what's going on. God's gone ahead in Jesus' name. And even though the enemy roams around like a roaring lion, seeking to intimidate, trying to manipulate the board of life, I want to encourage you, the lion of the tribe of Judah, man, he's already gone before. And we just got to keep relying on him. That as the enemy says, checkmate, God says, no such thing as checkmate. We triumph. We move forward in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, stand with you for a moment, please. Thank you, Holy Spirit. What a great day. What an amazing moment that we can stand here in the presence of God. Knowing, you know, and there's people here tonight, you just feel, man, the, the, the enemy, yeah, he's blocked me. Yeah, the enemy's blocked me. I want to tell you, no such thing. No such thing. No such thing. It seems like it. But he makes a way where there is no way. He even makes a path through the water, through the seas. He makes a way where there isn't a way. Whether it's in your relationship, your walk with God, your ministry. He'll always make a way. And I want to tell you, at the end of the day, if you are there, every the girls may have fallen down around you but you've gotten to where you need to be so don't quit don't give up in Jesus name and everybody said Father I just thank you right now for your anointing thank you Lord for your presence I thank you Lord for your enablement we thank you Lord that your grace that it's got us this far and I just pray, Lord, right around this auditorium in the next few moments. I pray, Lord, there may be a rising tide of the anointing of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And I just want those people here tonight that where you just feel stuck. It's not an embarrassment. Man, I feel stuck sometimes. I just think you need to do something about it. You might say it's all quiet. It's okay. I'm okay with quiet. I'm okay with loud. I'm, I'm okay. But if you're here tonight and you just feel you're stuck, it doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, I just want you to get out of your seat and come down the front right now. Come on. I know what it's like to be stuck. Come on, come. Right around the altar, just come. You just sing, man, it just seems like the, uh, the enemy's always kind of doing a, a counterattack. But I'll tell you, the end will not win because God has got his hand on your life. And ultimately, you will win. And ultimately, you will triumph. And ultimately, you are being formed and molded to be the person that God wants you to be at the end of the day our life is in the hand of God in Jesus name in Jesus name I just want us to raise our hands to the Lord for a few moments Sometimes in my life, I just say, oh God, what should I do? Which way should I turn? And 
Sometimes in those times where I've got to make decisions, sometimes the best decision is just getting down on my knees before God and saying, God, make the next move. In Jesus' name. There's relationships, there's careers, there's callings. I feel that some people here tonight, you just feel like you, 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 your calls, calling's going nowhere. I tell you, if you love God and you're serving and you feel like your calling's going nowhere, I tell you what's happening, your roots are going down deeper. Your roots are going down deeper. God never wastes anything. And if He's put it upon you at the proper time, in the right seasons, opportunities arise. God will take care of you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I'm just going to come around and just lay my hands upon you today. And I'm going to declare that God is fighting for us. I want to declare upon your life that, that God is working for us. In our private lives, in our finance, in our in our in our walk with God in our church God is working for us in Jesus name in Jesus name Father I just thank you in the name of Jesus.